Episodio del podcast más tecato del futuro, coño, el show. Mi nombre es Carlos Ortiz, el custodio de la Chicago Productions, y hoy estoy a sola, íntimo, aquí en este Zoom, con el símbolo sexual sexy de la Chicago Productions, Frank the Tank. Frank, ¿cómo está? ¿Qué, qué es la que hay? El setup nuevo. Eh, en los episodios anteriores estaba con el celular, ahora tengo la laptop, yo pienso que se ve un poquito mejor. En verdad el que background sí. ahí de mi cosita geeky. Sí, sí. No, tiene el background ahí típico de casi cualquier youtuber que habla de películas y de superheroes <risa> sí. y de cosas. O sea, todo el mundo. Sí. O sea, un background lleno de Funko, comic books, películas y videojuegos y figuritas. Normal. <risa> Yo estoy en la cocina para tener acceso ready para una beer que vamos a probar. Eh, el episodio de hoy es bien especial porque tenemos un invitado bien especial que se conectará prontamente, digamos como en media hora o, o 20 minutos se, conect, se estará conectando por ahí. Yo todavía no lo puedo creer, vamos a ver. Sí, eh, eh, es un escritor que ha trabajado tanto en televisión como en la industria de los comic books y por 10 años fue uno de los altos ejecutivos de una de las dos compañías principales de comic books de Estados Unidos. ¿verdad? Este, el que sepa y reconozca puede, saber, puede conocer el nombre Dandy Dio. So, sí, vamos a tener a Dandy Dio aquí en este episodio de Coño Show. Eh, los nervios están así un poquito como que... Yep. Pues, mm -hmm. Es la primera vez que vamos a tener un guest en Leche Coco que tiene hasta su... Perdí el audio. Yo te estoy escuchando bien, ¿me escuchas? Sí, no, eso fui yo, fui yo. Ok. Estamos bien. Este, pues como iba diciendo que es la primera vez que vamos a tener un guest que aparece hasta en Wikipedia, tú sabes. <ríe> so, estamos bien excited, eh, pero antes de que en lo que Dan llega, vamos a empezar con unas coñoticias de lo que ha pasado en las últimas semanas, tanto en beers y en entretenimiento y películas, que es lo que nos gusta. So, primero empezando con cuestión de beers, eh, cervecera del Callejón, que es una de las cerveceras más nuevas. Eh, aquí en Puerto Rico, que están en el viejo San Juan. Este fin de semana lanzaron su segunda cerveza, se llama IPA del Callejón. La primera era Saizón del Callejón, esta es IPA del Callejón. Pues, so parece que ese va a ser el gimmick de ellos. <ríe> Como que Sour del Callejón, Ajá. Amber del Callejón. Parece que ese va a ser el... el... Está, está gufiado. Pero esta es una IPA del Callejón, versión sin miedo. Dice que es una cerveza, una IPA jugosa, con notas de melocotón, mango y guayaba. So, suena súper interesante. No hemos todavía podido probar ninguna cerveza de cervecera del callejón. Hay que darse la vuelta. Tenemos que planificar algo para tirarnos para allá. A ver, para probar. ¿Está obligado? Eh, otra cerveza nueva también, de las cerveceras nuevas, este, Reina Mora, en Sabana Grande, anunció que va a lanzar una cerveza prontamente, una cerveza de trigo, una wheat. Eh, y lo más curioso, ya revelaron la, el arte de la lata y está bien nítido. Y el nombre, el nombre es Guatayir. Pero Guatayir escrito exactamente así como se escucha. O sea, G-U-A-T-A-Y-I-A-R. Guatayir. Inspirado en, pues, en what a, year, what a Year hemos tenido este 2020. El 2020 ataca de nuevo, tú sabes. Y la, el, el arte está bien nítido. Tiene como que, nada, es simplemente un desastre. Lo que te portray es como que viento huracanado, edificios agrietados pues por los terremotos, muchas cosas de referencia a todo el revolú, o sea, protestas, todo lo que está pasando en el año. Pero hay que ver cuando esa, esa cerveza salga, qué tal. Eh, otra cerveza nueva, eh, Fox, 
Brewing eh, lanzó una cerveza, se llama Red October IPA, la probé ahorita. Eh, Red October IPA, la probé, es una IPA, no está mala. El aroma no me gustó, el aroma tenía algo medio funky ahí, pero de sabor sabe, la encontré que sabía mucho a centeno, que supongo que pues usaron Rai para la cerveza o maybe fue algún, alguna malta que utilizaron que le da esa connotación así como de, de centeno. A mí me gusta mucho la Red IPA y comparando esa Fog Red IPA con otras Red IPA que he probado, pues tiene algo que, o, algo que le falta o algo que tiene de más, no estoy seguro que es. Pero está buena, pero no tiene ese, como que le falta ese it factor que tienen las Red IPA que son bien buenas. No sé. Yo no sé si ya he probado alguna Red IPA en algún momento. ¿Qué, qué otras Red IPA hay por ahí? Eh, conocida. Surk tiene una que ahora mismo no recuerdo el nombre. La, la lanzan de vez en cuando. Que es también con Centeno. Este, hay una que venía mucho antes de Founders que era Redonculus. Pero esa era una red IPA, era un, eso era ya como un triple doble o triple IPA, pero era una red IPA muy buena. Este, también había una de Bells eh, que se llamaba, eh, ah, se me va el nombre ahora, que vino por un momento, por un tiempo la estuvieron sacando y, y era este, tenía como un ring de boxeo, era la carátula, y ahora mismo se me escapa el nombre, mano. Pero era bien buena. Esta es lo que queda de la de la Red October IPA, y es, como puedes ver, pues un colorcito así rojizo, ámbar. Pero tiene el amargo de, del centeno. Te escucho bien bajito ahora, no sé por qué. El audio tuyo se... se... Pues déjame ver si puedo arreglarlo. Ahora, ahí, es que ahora te escucho bien. bien. Sí, estoy usando el mic de la computadora. Déjame acercarme más entonces. Sí, okay. te debe acercar más. Eh, hay otra cerveza que llegó recientemente, unas cervezas que llegaron recientemente acá a Puerto Rico, hace como dos semanas más o menos. Porque Clown Shoes empezó a llegar a Puerto Rico y hasta ahora todas las cervezas de Clown Shoes que he probado me han, me han encantado, en verdad están buenas. Y llegaron sí. dos más, dos Stouts llegaron hace par de semanas, una de ellas es la On Dead Party Crusher, que es un Imperial Stout, y la otra es Gordo, que también Gordo. entiendo que es un, es un Bourbon Battle Age Stout, pero tiene calabaza. Volviendo, o sea, ya estamos en esa época, tú sabes, en octubre. El Fox tiro Red October IPA, Ajá. y están saliendo la Oktoberfest, las cervezas de calabaza, eh, Colblot está haciendo una cerveza de calabaza actualmente, eh, calabazón. So, y con calabaza de verdad también. Porque sí, muchas de exacto. esas fucking beers, lo que en realidad usan son las especies y las cuestiones para simular un pumpkin pie, pero de calabaza no tienen nada. Eso es así. Pero esta, entiendo que esta de Clown Shoes tiene puré de calabaza sí. y... Por las fotos que vimos de, de, de Colblot, ellos tenían una bandeja así con un montón de calabaza, calabaza maja ahí, so van a usar puré de calabaza. Y pues, okay, eso me, cool. me imagino que se lo añade un, un toque. Las cervezas de calabaza en verdad no son mis favoritas. No, son no. Mis, yo no he probado una cerveza de calabaza que me encante. Vamos a probar la gordo ya mismo. Que, de hecho, voy a servirla ahora. Y en lo que yo sirvo la cerveza, Frank, Ajá. vamos a cambiar de cerveza a otro tema. Eh, Tatiana Maslany, no sé quién es, pero ella es la que va a ser de She-Hulk en la serie de, de Disney Plus. Ajá. Háblale a los coñistas en lo que yo voy sirviendo la beer. Este, habla a los coñistas de quién es Tatiana Maslany y por qué eso está cool. Si es que está cool, yo no sé en verdad, yo no sé quién es ella. Sí, sí, está súper cool. Este, Tatiana Maslany o Maslany, no sé cómo. Este, Carlos, espérate, no te vayas. Escucha como que doble el audio ahora por alguna razón. No sé si... Ponte en mute. Ah, déjame, déjame arreglar eso acá, mala mía. Eso fue porque desconecté aquí para poder escucharte, pero dale, pues habla con los coñistas. En lo que voy sirviendo acá. Ok. So, ajá. Este, reportaron que castearon a Tatiana Maslany este, para ser de She-Hulk. Tatiana, ella es conocida... Ahí está la cervecita, chévere. Ella es conocida porque ella es la protagonista de esta serie que se llama Orphan Black. Y esa muchacha le mete actuando bien cabrón. Ella en esa serie ya hace muchos papeles diferentes porque la serie se trata de diferentes clones. O so, ella hace un montón de, de, de papeles diferentes y tiene un acting range bastante chévere. So, este, yo pienso que como Jennifer Walters, que creo que es que se llama así, She-Hulk, 
ella puede hacer un tremendo papel. Así que, que vamos a ver cómo... Ya las que oscuritas es esa cerveza. Pero vamos a ver cómo le va a ella. Yo estoy pompeado con esa... Me imagino que esa serie saldrá en 2022 o algo así, porque con esto de la pandemia me imagino que se van a tardar un bastante tiempo en... en para poder empezar el production como tal. Eh, Sonada, si, si no han visto esa serie Air Fan Black, la recomiendo, es súper buena. Creo que ella ha ganado unos cuantos Emmys por la serie. Oh, nice. Súper oscurita. Eh, so, si están buscando una serie para ver, Air Fan Black definitivamente les va a gustar. Creo que es una serie de, de BBC Canadá y después la darán por BBC América. Eh, Check it out, está bien buena. Ahí llegó Carlos. Corriste, parece. Brutal, brutal. Este formato está bien loco. No tengo idea de qué dijiste. <risa> eh, nada, en, en, en resumen, Pero está bien, no lo repita. Pero okay. no tienes que repetirlo. La gente, <risa> la, el que está sintonizando lo escuchó, que es lo importante. Um, bueno. Vamos a probarla. ¿A qué te huele? Mm, dijiste que era barrel de age, ¿verdad? Yo creo que yo siento el un poquito de hints de... de sí, como, como de bourbon o algo así. Sí, de, de, sí. de alcohol, de licor. Un poquito de hints de, de licor. Mm, interesante. ¿Te gusta? Está bien interesante porque tiene esos hints de, del... O sea, se nota bien rápido la calabaza. O sea, rápido tiene un sabor que como que invade, que no es normal en este, estilo de en este tipo de cerveza. Y rápido me... Pues como sé que tiene calabaza, pues rápido logré identificarlo como calabaza. Yo creo que si no me dices que tiene calabaza, no lo, no lo siento. Pues... Como te digo, o sea, al saber que tiene calabaza fue que pude identificar el sabor, pero sí rápido me dio que hay un sabor ahí que no es lo normal para este tipo de stouts. Esta cerveza tiene bastante alcohol, ¿verdad? Se siente bastante. La, tiene 10.5% de alcohol. Ah, ok. Pensé que quizá era un poquito más alta. Está bien. Es un Imperial Pumpkin Stout. Y pues se hizo con spices y añejada en, en barriles de rye whisky. Estábamos hablando ahorita de Centeno con la, la red IPAs. Pues, este, añejada en Whistle Pig in the 10-year rye whiskey barrels, adding a unique and complex butter flavor. Eh, y, tiene, y tiene puré, tal y como dijimos, ten, tiene tanto especias de o sea, pumpkin spice como también tiene puré de calabaza. Yo creo que no sabe, o sea, que típicamente las pumpkin ales saben como a pumpkin pie. Yep. Pero sabe más como a las especias de pumpkin pie. Y no necesariamente una cerveza tiene que ser de calabaza para tener ese tipo de sabor. Porque, por ejemplo, hace años atrás, Ingeniero Microbrewery había hecho una cerveza con, que era de bateta, batata mamella. Y cuando tú la probabas, en realidad sabía como si fuera un pumpkin ale, como si fuera una cerveza de, de, de calabaza. Y era porque utilizaba las mismas especias que se usan para la cerveza de calabaza. Usaba el ah, pumpkin vaya. spice. Ok. O sea, en realidad de batata no tenía nada. Lo que ten, o sea, sabía como si fuera de, pom, de calabaza. Y esta pues no, me, no sabe como si tuviese pumpkin spice. No sabe un pumpkin pie. No, no, no. No creo que hayan usado las especies esas. Dame cogerlo suave con esta cervecita porque si no... Sí, sí. Este, ¿Qué más tenemos por ahí? En lo, eh, los cines, mano. Los cines en Puerto Rico ya abrieron de nuevo. Eh, ya estren, Entiendo que ya estrenó la primera película... Eh, es la película esta no recuerdo el nombre que es con Russell Crowe que anyway no se ve muy interesante en mi opinión pero lo, sí, lo que es esa? una ahí que parece que el tipo una, está en un tapón y una tipa le pasa por el lado y le toca bocina y él lo toma personal y pues este, se va en un viaje de road rage stalking a la tipa y como que le hace la vida imposible whatever como que por un eh, momento me recordó a, a Blown Away ¿te acuerdas de esa película? Habló una güey, ¿por qué no, rayos? Wey, ¿qué se llama? No, no, pero. Se llama? Going down to. Falling down, tú dices. Falling down, ¿eh? Con, con, falling down con, con Michael Douglas. 
con Michael Douglas, esa, esa es la que... Sí, te... sí, algo así es lo que me recuerda, algo así como Falling Down parece ser. Pero peor porque eh, en Falling Down Michael Douglas se nota que tiene una guerra campal contra el mundo entero. Ajá, aquí es con una persona específica. Aquí es con una persona específica porque le tocaron bocinas, como que, what? <risa> ok. Y creo que parte del mensaje, por lo que vi en el trailer, es como que es que tú no sabes por lo que cada persona está pasando y un bocinazo que tú le metas a alguien, tú no sabes si eso es lo que lo saca de lo saca de, de quicio y lo... Claro, claro. Pero no sé, eso no justifica que tú vayas hasta el stalking a una persona y querer no. matarla o whatever, lo que, o sea, hacerle la vida imposible, no sé. Whatever. Suena interesante, pero no para arriesgarme a coger COVID en el cine. No, no, no sé. a mí no me interesaría ir al cine a ver esa película, ni siquiera aún si no hubiese lo del COVID. Sin embargo, Tenet, que es la película que más llevo esperando de este año, eh, octubre 1. Según la página de Caribbean Cinema, acá en Puerto Rico va a estrenar Tenet octubre 1 y octubre 8, la semana después, va a estrenar la película que tú más estabas esperando, que es New Mutants. Ah, so, ¿Tú te, arriesga, te arriesgarías para ver New Mutants? Para ver Tenet, definitivamente, y para New Mutants también. Siempre y cuando yo, yo vea que los cines están siguiendo lo, lo, los métodos de, de distanciamiento y, y estén limpiando y todo, me puedo arriesgar. Yo sé que ya anunciaron, son varios cines que van a estar este, abiertos. So, eh, entiendo que el de Aguadilla es uno de ellos. Pues, y estoy de acuerdo, eh, pienso igual que tú. Me gustaría ver cómo son pues, los, los protocolos que están utilizando de, de limpieza y de distanciamiento, porque no, no quiero estar en el cine. O sea, las butacas del cine son las butacas que, o sea, es como en los aviones. Esos son los, este tipo de espacios que menos cumple ese distanciamiento social para nada. Ni siquiera hay distanciamiento y punto. O sea, tú compartes el armrest con la persona de al lado, ¿entiendes? Ajá. O sea... <risa> Así de problemático es, es como están acomodados esos, esas butacas, esos asientos. Y en los aviones pasa lo mismo. So, yo espero que eso lo estén bregando de alguna forma. Me dejen tres butacas a cada lado y, y en la fila detrás de mí, en la fila al frente mío, no haya nadie tampoco. Porque espero no, que sea una, algo así. No, yo quiero una fila completa para mí y, y tres filas por el medio del próximo, tú sabes. Yo no quiero, yo no quiero a nadie en mi fila. Porque tiene que pasarme por el frente, ¿verdad? Para ir a su asiento. O sea, yo no quiero eso. Pues, eso es otro, eso es otro, otro issue, pero para eso está la mascarilla, pienso yo. O sea, la, la mascarilla, el uso de mascarilla, donde más de verdad lo necesitas es cuando no puedes tener distanciamiento social. Claro, están pidiendo en el cine que tengas la mascarilla puesta todo el tiempo, a menos que estés comiendo, pero también escuché que supuestamente van a designar una área para comer. Y, pero no sé si eso es dentro de la sala o fuera de la sala, no sé cómo va a ser de verdad. Hay un par de cosas que no sé, tenemos que comunicarnos y, y buscar más feedback de la gente que sí se ha tirado la maroma de ir a, al cine a ver qué tal. Hasta ahora lo que yo he visto son stories que se han compartido por ahí en internet y la gente está contenta porque pues por fin están teniendo la experiencia de ir al cine. Y mientras estén bien vacíos, entiendo que no, va, no hay mucho issue. Yo creo que la mayoría de la gente no va a querer ir al cine. Yeah. Aún cuando estrene Tenet, tú sabes, aún cuando empiezan a estrenar estas películas. Sin embargo, en Estados Unidos... Muchas películas así que son blockbusters, que se supone que hubiesen salido desde el verano, como Black Widow, este, eh, la de Disney, esta animada Soul, eh, la de James Bond. Todas estas películas, creo que todo eso ya confirmado, todo se tiró ahora para el año que viene, va para el 2021. So, los cines en Estados Unidos ahora están en esta situación en la que habrán cines para el 2021, porque van a estar seis meses más sin películas, sin estrenos, sin gente yendo a los cines. Yo lo veo bien difícil, porque ajá, Wonder Woman y todos estos blockbusters que van a salir este año, Dune, de seguro también la van a atrasar, si no es que la atrasaron ya. Yo no veo cómo los cines puedan sobrevivir, tú sabes. Ponle que cierren, ¿verdad?, para pa minimizar costos, pero como quiera tienen que pagar renta, tienen que pagar este, utilidades, whatever. Seis meses sin operar está feo. Yo pienso que muchos cines van a cerrar y quizás sobreviva uno que otro chain, pero lo veo bien feo. Yo... 2021 va a estar bien interesante. De cines de Estados Unidos, AMC. Y AMC está en una situación bien, preco porque, o sea, bien precaria porque entiendo que ellos habían hecho un montón de, de préstamos y, de, y habían pues, tenido dinero que habían sacado de inversionistas para poder hacer ciertas eh, como remodelaciones o mejoras al, al sistema de ellos y a los cines de ellos. Y al 
venir la pandemia, o sea, ellos están en la, en la etapa de que se supone que empiecen a pagar ese dinero para atrás. So, ellos, están en, ellos están en deuda. Y habrán hecho inversiones también en preparar sus cines para esta cuestión del distanciamiento también, tú sabes. Tiene Exacto, que haber encima de eso. Exacto. Que yo no sé de verdad qué va a pasar eh, si los cines, si esto se escocota de verdad, es un cambio monumental en la cuestión del entretenimiento y cómo se va a consumir, porque entiendo que entonces todo se movería más a streaming. Y si eso sucede, yo creo que le podemos decir adiós a, a los blockbusters, como los conocemos hoy en día, las películas estas de eh, 150 millones para arriba de budget, tú sabes, van a ser cosas más pequeñas, este, con budgets de, no sé, menos de 100 millones. Porque sí, porque nunca porque... van a recuperar el dinero. Uh -huh. Sí, la, 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 una película que tiran por streaming jamás y nunca hace la cantidad de dinero que una película que se lanza en los cines. Tú me ves, estabas mencionando el otro día de la posibilidad de que maybe compañías más grandes compren estos cines. Sería interesante que, pues, ponle que, ojalá no pase, pero ponle que AMC y, y todos estos todo chains, Regal, qué sé yo, de allá afuera, no puedan este, sobrevivir y Amazon o... o qué sé yo, Apple, Google, no sé, compañías inmensas de estas los compren y obviamente con la cantidad de dinero que tienen esas compañías pueden aguantar un tiempito en lo que se recupera todo esto. Pudiese pasar, eh, pues, sigue Amazon comprando el mundo, tú sabes. Sí, yo, Amazon, Apple son las más así que yo veo. No creo que a Apple le interese meterse en el... Oh, mira... Ahora vamos a cambiar nuestra conversación a inglés porque se acaba de conectar aquí Dandy Dio. So vamos a... Welcome a Dandy Dio acá al, al, al podcast. Thank you for joining us, joining us here at, at our podcast, Leche Coco Productions, con your show. It's really amazing for us. Like, we never thought you'd say yes, but hey... Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I have people that sit next to me and they make sure I say yes to everything. For <laughs> <laughs> Jorge, for Jorge. Yeah, that's it. That's your brother-in-law. Alan, my brother-in-law, yes. <laughs> so, um, first thing, like, we wanted to write, Fran, uh, about your, basically your secret origin. Like, how did you start up as a writer? As a writer? Oh, my gosh. Um... You know, I, ever when I was a kid, I was like, I enjoyed writing. I, you know, I used to write for like things like even for the school newspaper, uh, you know, things as silly as that sounds, but I used to do that. And then when I was young, probably starting as early as 16, 17, I started submitting uh, stories and ideas into different companies, mostly comic book companies and all that. I got a, I got an envelope in my house full of rejection letters uh, <laughs> from everybody. Uh, I used to send ideas out all the time. Um, Then ultimately, uh, you know, I started working in um, in uh, in TV and I worked on a number of television shows, uh, worked with, at CBS and I worked at ABC, uh, worked in publicity for the soap operas. Uh, but then I got into children's television and through there I started working with other writers and then meeting other producers. So um, I did a little bit of writing um, like articles and that for, about comics. For, for a number of years. Um, but my actually, my first published, published work was actually um, an, a television show, an animated series. Uh, I worked on a show called Reboot, which was the first computer generated series. And uh, I wound up doing some writing there. I, I, I wrote a couple of episodes of that. And then from there, I was able to get, um, working with a, another writer, uh, Jimmy Pamiati, we were able to get a job uh, on Superboy at DC. And strangely enough, I got the job on Superboy writing And completely independent of that, I started interviewing uh, for a position at the company. And there were two separate tracks. Everybody thought they were associated with each other. They weren't. They were just two different things happening at the same time at the same company, which is just, you know, just coincidence. And then ultimately, once I got the job at DC, um, I stopped writing for a while. Uh, but then um, as time went on and I was there longer, I started to write as I was working with the company. You know, and I, I like to find all the weird characters and the strange ideas and things that nobody else wants to do that I can have some fun with. You know, and I, I leave the big characters and the big stories to everybody else. But I, I like all the crazy stuff. Were you but, uh, always, it's been a long journey. You know, it's been a long journey. Were you always into comics uh, since you were young or is that something you picked up later? Yeah, I mean, I've got, I've got comics. I actually got comics that I bought when I was a kid. Um, 
uh, from the 1960s. I still have them. They're, they're crumbled. You know, the, the, the covers are all ripped up, but I, I wouldn't give up with them in a the world. I mean, I've always enjoyed comics. Um, it, I've always found a way to make comics part of my life. Um, even when I worked in television, I found out ways to, um, to meet comic creators and actually, um, I actually did a crossover, believe it or not, with one of my actors when I was working on All My Children, which is a soap opera. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working with one of our actors and we crossed over with uh, The Second Life of Dr. Mirage from Valiant Comics. So I always found a way to do things together. And then when I was working in children's television, I used to hire a lot of comic book writers that I knew to come do and write and develop product for me uh, in TV. So I always found a way to get comics into my work. And even, even at Mainframe, when we did Reboot, Everybody was a comic book fan, so comic book talk was our shorthand. We would describe things by the way of discussing comics, like this should look like Doctor Strange's world, or this should feel like Iron Man, or this should be Silver Surfer. And everybody knew what we were discussing because we all shared that common interest. Do you remember what was the first comic book that you bought? Um, it's an interesting question because I, I have, I have um, – Probably the earliest comic that somebody bought for me, I would say, um, which I still have, is the Flintstones go to the 1964 World's Fair in New York. <laughs> Just said that, said that straight. Okay, I got that. And around the same time, I think I've got um, a classic illustrated uh, of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Uh, but for superheroes, um, it was Amazing Spider-Man number 40, uh, Spidey Saves the Day. Um, so he's standing over the Green Goblin. I, I, I remember Green Goblin on the cartoon, so I always loved the character. So when I saw him on the cover, um, my, my parents bought me the book. <laughs> Friend, do you remember the first one you bought? I'm just curious, because I, I think I'd never asked you that. Uh, well, know. I bought probably the first comic I bought on my own might have been either a Where Monsters Dwell, which was a horror reprint book from Marvel, or a House of Mystery. I'm not sure which one came first, uh, but there was, a, there was a Where Monsters Dwell, there was Gorgilla. <laughs> It's a giant, giant, like shaggy gorilla creature. And I was a big King Kong fan. So anything that had monsters on covers, I just, I, I jumped all over. And then there was this House of Secrets. Uh, gosh, you know, you don't remember these numbers. 193, I think it was. Where this, there's this guy being killed by puppets. And this <laughs> These kids are looking around the corner like, oh, my God, the puppets came to life. And I'm like, e you know, and it reminds me, in those days, the cover is really what pulled you in. That made, made you bought the book. You're not buying it because of the name of a person, uh, the artist or the writer. You're buying it because the image on the cover is intriguing and you want to really find out what the story is about. And, you know, I think, I think that's something that's, been, that's a lost art, but the covers were great sales tools for a long period of time, you know. Uh, Francisco, what about you? Do you remember the first comic you bought? I, th I think I never asked you that. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to remember the first one I bought, but I do remember the first one I read, though. Uh, I got a, a whole a stack of comics from, from my dad from the 70s, the really old uh, beat-up comics, and uh, they had a whole bunch of Batman comics in it. And that's when I discovered Batman. It was the 70s Batman. I think maybe Dennis O'Neill wrote. Yeah. That yeah. Yeah. Pretty much writing it all at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then I fell in love with Batman after that. Yeah. Right? And it's just gotten better ever since. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first comic I remember buying was an X-Men comic, but it was based on the, you remember the X-Men animated uh, series from the 90s? Yeah. Sure. So it was uh, basically a comic book adaptation from the animated series. Oh, wow. I thought so, you were going to say, like, they, they, had, they had X-Men comics in Pizza Hut for a little while, you know? Oh, yeah, I yeah, that. yeah, I, I, I did have, what, yeah, I had those too. Yeah, I think that was, yeah, that was the, that, actually, that was the first one, yeah. The one from Pizza Hut. When you say it's based on the animated series, or the TV show, I'm thinking it's got to be tied into some giveaway or something else going on there. Yeah, because normally a lot of stuff, they didn't do much of that on the main line, but they did do it on the sides. And when that show was on the air, I was at ABC competing with it and getting our butts whipped every day. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know why. You know, we did an animated version of Free Willy. I can't believe it didn't beat X-Men. <laughs> 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 
Maybe if, maybe if the whale was a mutant or something, we it, it, like, it, it, the whale could talk. <laughs> believe it or not. No, oh, oh, so it, it, it was a super whale. <laughs> I don't know. It's a cartoon. <laughs> yeah. Simpler times. Simpler times. <laughs> so, talking about TV and all that, like the recent, uh, uh, the unprecedented success that that TV and movies have had in the last, I, I'd say, the last decade. Uh, and I'm talking about TV and movies uh, based on comic books. Like, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? That's, uh, I don't know. It, well, it's... You know, um, I was talking with Keith Giffen. We had, we had a talk a long time ago when I first started there. And one of the first things Keith Giffen said to me is, as, as soon as they can do comics better on TV and movies, comics will be dead. And um, you can see a definite wane of interest in the print periodicals and the print storytelling because the, cop, the movies and the television shows and the amount of them there are are really filling that need for those fans looking for that type of storytelling right now. So in, in that way, so I think it's a great thing to see them go out there and do this and attract more people. But at the same time, I think it might have hurt the comics business overall. Um, because I don't think you're going to get a casual reader or somebody who wants to learn about these characters come to a comic when you have movies and TV so accessible that they can learn about the characters through that at the same, at the same time, same way. So, and, and the good thing is it's, it's a great evolution for, um, for the characters, the superhero characters. Now this, the comic books themselves, they also have to evolve. They also have to change and, and be something else. If, if, the superhero isn't the sole driver of why people want to read comics anymore. How's I that for name? <laughs> Sorry, um, I got serious. <laughs> I thought Francisco was going to say something, but so he, he was thinking. I could see he was thinking something. Yeah. So no, I, I I tend to agree with you, uh, but I would also say that some shows and 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 movies have driven people to maybe want to read more about those characters and maybe go out and buy the, the comic and just delve into a, a specific character. Like, for example, uh, after I saw Black Panther, the movie, I kind of wanted to read Black Panther comics, see what that character was about. Same thing with Captain America. I was not never into Captain America before the movies, but then I kind of I kind of fell in love with the character and then I, I went on to buy comics and read more about him. So there's examples of that too. The, the, my, the, my question would be to you is, were you a comic book reader before you did that, or did that get you into the comics? Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. I already read comics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. That, that, that's, and that's the logic. It, you know, look, we see the best example of television driving sales of comics, believe it or not, uh, was Walking Dead. Uh, the Walking Dead television show was such a phenomenon that they couldn't keep graphic novels of Walking Dead on the shelves they were selling like crazy and they sold intensely well for over two years. Any type of version, you know, a six issue collection, an omnibus, didn't matter. Stuff was selling like crazy. That was the best lift we ever saw. Uh, at DC, our best lift we ever saw from people coming from movies to comics was really um, Watchmen. Uh, what happened was um, when they, they ran the trailer of Watchmen at the end of the Dark Knight movie, uh, it was an eight-month period of time from the time that they ran the trailer to when the Watch movie was going to premiere. And in those eight months, DC Comics sold one million copies of the trade. One million. Wow. Um, and what you find is it's not – what you said is actually almost what we see, what we used to track. It wasn't people buying comics because they saw it in a movie and they wanted to watch more adventures. The things that they bought were the things that they wanted to find out what the inspiration for the movie was. What were the ideas behind the movie? What set up the movie? Where did the, where did, where, where did the origin, you're asking for origins? What was the origin of the character in the comics that made the movie? So it happened, so to speak. That's the stuff they were interested in. They weren't interested in continuing tales. They were more interested in the stuff that helped establish the world of that character. Um, so that's why you see a lot of ramp, ramp up of material before the movie comes out because there's a real appetite and interest in anticip anticipation for when the movie's about to come out. So people are buying things and reading things to learn about as much as they can about the characters. So when they go in the movie, they're almost armed with the level of knowledge and expectation for what's going to happen when the movie takes place. So that's the way we used to be able to track it in that fashion, you know? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, I also, I've seen that not only 
you have some uh, cases, like you said, uh, like The Walking Dead driving sales for a comic book. And maybe, uh, but as you said, driving the sales for the origin, the, the source material. But also, there's this thing that I don't like that much that I've seen, uh, like the, the popularity of the movies or the TV shows sometimes drive also creative changes in the in the story of the in the in the like sometimes they even change the the powers or the or the or the origin story of the character they change something that was that used to be i mean one as a, as an old school fan of, of a character could think that that was untouchable that, yeah. that some some aspect of the story was on top of its origin or, or the or was untouchable but then since the movie became so popular or the tv series and they Uh, presented the character in a different way. Now in the comic book, you see how they start to change the character to fit what the movie is telling. And I hate when that happens. I don't know, but I guess it's business, you know? Hey, remember when the Wolverine was a short guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> All of a sudden, you Jackman gets real popular. <laughs> All of a sudden, he's a tall guy in the comics. How'd that happen? <laughs> it, you know what? It, 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 it goes into the logic you said before. The thought is that it's going to attract the people who might follow it out of curiosity. And if they see something that in the comic that they, that they liked in the movie, that they're going to follow it along in that fashion. It, it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword um, because ultimately you can argue both sides. You got to change something to bring new people in. because that's what usually gets them is that the sense that they want to come in on a starting point on the ground, uh, on the ground floor and learn the character with them. You want to also be true to the characters as people remember them because there's a real base there. And unfortunately, just like everything else in the world, these two things almost seem opposed to each other rather than working in, in unison. And it, it, what it does, it fractures your audience. It fractures your, um, your, your real collective weight of a character. That was one of my big problems with um, things like the multiverse or Earth 2 or anything else or these multiple interpretations of characters is that what it did, it, it fractured the fan base and, you know, we use the flash for example. I had people who wanted a Wally West flash or a Barry Allen flash or whatever other flash there is. And you start to split them up. And instead of people just wanting to rally around the character flash, they were rallying around versions of the character and you got smaller and smaller bites of the audience and you didn't have enough, appreciable weight to really drive anything in a, in a real meaningful manner, you know? So that's why they always try to collapse it down. I mean, but that's not just something I did. I mean, if you go back to early nineties, uh, when, when Green Lantern wasn't working all that well and they decided to kill Hal Jordan and kill off the core and just make one Green Lantern, uh, Kyle Rayner, you know, and the idea that that one person would be so unique that anybody who's a Green Lantern fan will just gravitate to Kyle Rayner. And that, unfortunately, that didn't happen. And then uh, then you start changing it again, and all of a sudden you're on that slippery soap that it feels like you're constantly changing things over and over again, just trying to find that that magic formula, so to speak. Yeah, that, that's a good example, because there there's a Hal Jordan enthusiast, there's Kyle Rayner enthusiast, and because of the Justice League animated series, There's also uh, 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 John Stewart. Stewart. There's yeah. John Stewart, John Stewart enthusiast. So you have different, the same, uh, different versions of the same character, and what you said, different fan bases. You would say, uh, yeah, that's. When I, got, seen, when, when, I got, when I got to DC, Kyle Rayner was the Green Lantern, and there was an organization called Heat that would write us almost every week and go on the message boards and everything like that. And he was about bringing back Hal Jordan. I think it was or something so crazy. I can't even tell you, um, but, 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 uh, but you could see, you know, and it, it's interesting because I mean, people do, I think people get more worked about their fictional characters than they do the real people in their lives. In some ways, it's just this interesting thing because there's a level of expectation <laughs> that, that unfortunately your family, you'll never get from your family, but you hope to get from your fictional characters. <laughs> and, and <laughs> I, I, yeah, that just, I guess that's, yeah, fandom, right? Like, yeah, it sure is. <laughs> um, but you, you, what you were talking about, like uh, everything that you've been, uh, what we were talking about uh, brings Uh, brings me to something that I've talked about with Francisco a lot that about how uh, sometimes I like to comp like sometimes it fr frustrates me uh, the issues with continuity in comic books. Oh, 
Okay. And, and I like to compare sometimes, I, I make this analogy of, of comparing like co American comic books with Japanese uh, manga. Right. And Japanese manga is mostly creator owned. So most stories have a beginning and an end. Right. But the way American comic books work, right? It's uh, the owner is the publishing house. So they, they, have, they need to keep the, these characters and this story going on forever. And sometimes I think that to, for, I think it, it makes it more difficult for the writers and the creators. I mean, it's great that it, they have a challenge when they come to write a book with all this canon, dragging all the canon and all this. But at the same time, it, it gets to a point that you can write yourself into a corner, you know, uh, like historically you, the, the book writes itself into a corner. So yeah, that's why you get so many reboots and restarts. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess. As I, as I used to explain, well, two things. First thing on uh, when Stan Lee started working on the Marvel universe, right? When he started building the Marvel universe, as the story goes, Stan always expected the characters to age out and change. That's why Spider-Man was getting older. Uh, that's why he graduated high school and ultimately graduated college. And then ultimately they start to hit an age where they get too old and then everybody freezes. And then they start to roll up. Um, and my, my running joke for DC was that, um, that um, anytime, uh, so the problem was that Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman never really aged. They were all around early 30s, mid 30s, something like that. And they never really aged. But every other character was aging around them. You know, Green Arrow was aging, and Relante was aging. And I always used to joke whenever Nightwing or Dick Grayson got older than Bruce Wayne, then we knew we had to reboot the universe. <laughs> and and that, was, that, that was the concept is that every time, because Dick Grayson was this big and he's, oh, he's the same. So all of a sudden now he looks like he's going to be older than Bruce Bruce Wayne. Um, so sooner or later, you got to pull the plug and start over again. And that used to bleed to the reboots over and over again. And because ultimately, because you're right, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman are so iconic as, as, as not just as characters, but just in what they mean to so many people and what they stand for. Now they almost become more iconic than actually characters for storytelling. You know, they represent ideals, they represent, thought, you know, they represent causes and personalities. And, you know, when people wear the symbols of Superman, Batman and Wonder Woman, they're making a statement about themselves, not just to show that they're a fan of that character. They're really talking about themselves in their interesting way. Um, so that makes it hard. So you can really can't change them all that much or change them in ways that you think would show a level of progression, you know, and ultimately... The, the comic books is built on the sense of continuity, like things are moving forward. But the problem is that the goal was that the audience was supposed to move through, you know, so we'd have a new group of 10 to 15 year olds coming through every five to 10 years. So that way you can retell the same stories and retell the same things over and over again to a brand new fan base and just change a little bit along the way. But what happened is that the fans started to age with the characters. And the talent started to age as well. And the talent aged the characters with themselves to age with the fans that aging with everybody. And all of a sudden we got an older audience instead of an audience that's younger. And yeah. I always, you know, and I went from an audience that basically went from saying my mother threw my comics out when I was a kid to my mother just bought me a whole bunch of comics that she wants to read me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that what you just said about bringing a, a younger audience uh, in, in the notes I sent you, I said, can we talk about sidekicks, but I'm not going to really ask you anything because I know th th it's, it's something that has been talked about a lot with you. Yeah. Anyway. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of sidekicks, uh, <laughs> but, I, I just, I just, but I, I just really want to just share my thoughts on that sure. with you. And please, if you want to chime in, fine. <laughs> but I, I, what I just wanted to say is like, I get it. You know, <laughs> I get it. I, I like the reason why sidekicks, if you have to look at why the reason why sidekicks were created, it was to what you said, bring an, uh, bring in a younger audience yes. and it worked for a time. And that's why yes. you saw that everybody, every superhero got a sidekick all of a sudden, but then it, 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 it was, a, it was a simpler time. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and then it stopped working and that's why everybody went solo again. And the sidekicks were relegated to, to, like to nowhere basically and then brought back in some other books or whatever or in some special cases but the thing is like to be honest like the most uh the most famous uh psychic ever in pop culture is robin it's dick yeah. grayson's robin and it wasn't i mean i i was born in 82 and from my perspective 
it wasn't because of the comics. It, it, it was because of the 1960s TV series, the Absolutely. Batman TV series. That's why Robin was so popular. And you know what? When I was a kid and we were playing around in the, in the neighborhood with other kids playing about being superheroes, nobody wanted to be a sidekick. <laughs> nobody wanted to be a sidekick to no one. Like, <laughs> and that's why you got to kill Dick Grayson. You know? <laughs> 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 no, you listen. It's like you're, you're absolutely right. Sidekicks were it's really a it's really an invention in the ni- of the 1940s, you know. And you think about it, there was a lot of things there. There was a lot of kid point of view, and they wanted to bring kids in to really help elevate or draw, draw attention to the older characters and try to be the entry point for the kids with the older characters. So I mean, that's why you see sidekicks appear, and that was the thing. What what Stan Lee did is he he flipped it though. If you think about it. Spider-Man was the sidekick. He didn't, he was he was the teenager. He was the young entry point. Yeah. So he didn't have an older version. So immediately the lead character was the one that was relating to the younger audience. And then if you get Fantastic Four, the sidekick's buried inside the sh- inside the team, which is Johnny. which is the torch. And then even that, he spins him off to his own series. So there's a lot of things in there that they used to hide along the way. Um, but the Hulk had a sidekick, had a sidekick. He had Rick Jones, you know, and that didn't work. And it wasn't until he got rid of those themes and just put the focus on the lead character um, that it really started to take off. So it's, it's, I always, I, you know, I spent a lot of time just watching and, and deep dissecting and deconstructing comics and stories because I like to see how things are made and how they develop. Um, and because ultimately you want to know the logic and ideas that went into certain things. And if it works, you want to be able to figure out the formula to replicate it. And if it doesn't work, you want to find out why they did it and see if there's a better way to do what they did. If it was for a good reason, if, if they found a way that didn't work. So I'm always looking at how you deconstruct stories and characters and then reassemble them in, in, in different ways, just, just to keep the, the pot fresh, but also trying to find a way to find that secret formula to create a book that works. And yes, we're going for beer now, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs> you're gonna say something, friends? I thought you would. Yeah, uh, no, uh, you're, you were mentioning, well, basically you already stated your point about why you don't, you don't like sidekicks. It's because they, they get to the point where they can't grow anymore right because of the age difference between batman and superman and wonder woman so it, it makes sense that those characters are you're not able to develop them further but uh what about uh exploring uh those characters in like a different universe uh <laughs> you, you know what here's the here it, 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 yeah, my other big issue with sidekicks and since we're on it <laughs> <laughs> I could I, I could get it out of my system now because it doesn't matter. Um, my other big issue with sidekicks is how how dangerous can a villain be if a 10 to 12 year old kid can beat him? <laughs> Think about it. So I'm here with an adult and I got a 10 to 12 year old kid and the 10 to 12 year old kid beats the guy. What's that say about the adult? First of all, why is he sending the 10 to 12 year old kid in to fight him instead of himself? <laughs> And on top of that, if that kid could beat him, why is that guy even there? <laughs> so, and if he's and if the creature and if the character he's fighting is so dangerous that the kid's in danger, why are you bringing a kid into danger? So, these are all the questions. You know what I mean? Yeah. These, and I mean, again, it's a simpler time when these when these things are first happened than when they're first created. But now that you start to deconstruct them and reassemble them, it becomes it becomes harder to see. And, you know, I used to use that same logic with a lot of the teen books, okay? Um, in particular, one of the things we used to have the biggest argument about attempt about is trying to make Legion of Superheroes work. It had a very successful run for, for a period of time, but, but to relaunch it and reestablish it, it was a very hard book to reestablish. First reason why is that when you look at the basic conceits and principles, when Legion of Superheroes created, it's created in the late late fifties, I believe, like 1958, 1959. So first things first, the concept of Legion of Superheroes is 60 years old, um, which means that they're kids. These aren't kids anymore. Mm-hmm. So that's the first one. Second second thing is too is that. At that time in America, you have a lot of boys clubs, you have a lot of organizations. They were always pushing teen organizations and youth organizations and such like that. So the Legion of Superheroes was a reflection of the youth organizations at that moment in time. That's not something as, 
as you see people aggressively trying to build at today right now and trying to do. Um, I always just said that if we're going to do the Legion of Superheroes, I got to set play dates. And that way everybody comes in for a planet and we meet for a play date every <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you got to think about what time you're in um, and, and try to contextualize that. And then when Legion really worked the best is when they matured them. They were in they were in relationships. It was much more complex. And I think ultimately that's that's one of the things they had to realize is that they had to bring that complexity in because the audience truly did age with the Legion. You have, we have very big Legion fans. We have big, very big Dick Grayson fans. We have very big Wally West fans, primarily because the people – Age with that character. They read those characters when they were younger. They were the same age of the character, and those characters got older with them. So they feel that their life is, you know, maturing and growing with them. When I talk to Wally West fans about Flash, they want the, his family back. Why? Because they're in families, they're married relationships, so they they have children, and they have things that are very relatable to him. So it only makes sense that he should be in the same place they're in because they age together. And the most interesting thing people ever said to me, and, and this is more than once, they go to me, they go, I just want to make sure he's okay. They're telling me they want to make sure the characters are okay. And I'm like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> These are superheroes. I'm supposed to mess up their lives. And blah, blah. I just want them. To, he's with his family. Just leave him and his family. Okay. Make sure him and his family. Okay. And I'm like, that's not the way these books work, <laughs> but that's the way they want life to work. That's the way they want to see their life. They want to see how this works. So I understand that and you, you relate to it, but unfortunately you got to keep breaking things. That's what the whole purpose of, you know, drama and entertainment and action is all about is that you constantly got to give them problems and challenges constantly over and over again. You got to keep on mixing it up or else the last thing you want is everybody to get set and boring. I didn't want, we never wanted to do the comic words when all the superheroes on the couch trying to figure out what to watch on TV or more importantly, whether or not they want to buy streaming services, you know? <laughs> <laughs> How about a comic about the superheroes trying to decide on what comic book to go to? Exactly. To, to, <laughs> to, 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 Lois, you okay? Okay, good. Just don't do anything. I'm going to watch the show. <laughs> no, no trouble while I'm watching TV. <laughs> I don't know. I, it, in the, I still think that nobody wanted to be a psychic anyway. To, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 still, I just want to... I, I still think that I, I think all the sidekicks that got cool, like Wally, Wally got cool because he got to be the Flash at some point. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, Bucky got cool because he got to be the Winter Soldier when he came back yeah. from the dead. Like uh, 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 Dick Grayson got cool because he became they all came back from the, every, Everybody's come back from the dead. That's no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But every sidekick that got cool got cool when they were an adult. Like, yeah. That's when they like they became their own person. However, their origin is still tied to another person, but another character. Or, or when they worked with kids their own age, then oh, yeah. it was you know what I mean. It, that's why Teen Titans. Teen Titans, yeah. But actually, that's why Legion worked early on too. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's a there's a when you see them all operating at their own age level, dealing with people with themselves. Then they have the same problems, the same situations, the same personal issues, and then there's a more a more interesting sense of competition. But you know, that when you have a, a kid running one side by side with a guy, uh, I don't know. About it. <laughs> <laughs> so neither of you like Damien or Tim Drake. I, I think those are cool Robins. I mean, they're my favorites. They well, Damien, like, yeah. da you know, Damien is my favorite for a reason, though, not for a because I, I loved what Graham Morrison did with the character. There was a lot of great logic behind when he brought Damien in. The, the, first of all. If a kid's going to run side by side with you, it makes sense if it's your father and son. So that made more sense to me to see that. The second thing what Grant did is that he made Damien raised by Ray Ghoul. So this kid is just as intense as Bruce Wayne was, you know, in some ways. So therefore, you feel that he has the, the physical strength and the, the motivation to be able to manage being put into dangerous situations. But when Grant, remember when Damien was first introduced, Dick Grayson was Robin. I mean, I'm sorry, Dick Grayson was Batman. And yeah. So, yeah, so what he did was he came to us and he pitched us the, the paradigm. He goes, he goes, look, you know, Batman's the angry character and Robin, the grace is there to lighten him up, to give him a different point of view. And in that case, a sidekick makes perfect sense. Okay. I'm going to give you that one. Okay. It, was a nice, it made a nice counterpoint. And so these two characters acting and doing the same thing, they were diametrically opposed in their personalities and sensibilities. So what happened is when, 
Dick Grayson becomes Batman, he says, just because Dick Grayson's Batman, that's not going to make him grim and gritty right there. It's not going to, that doesn't mean that happens. So what he did is he kept Dick Grayson's much lighter personality as Batman. And then he made Robin grim and gritty. So they flip roles. So, and Dick stayed true to who he was. And then Damien comes in and be the angry little kid. And I love that dynamic. It's some of my favorite Batman books is when, when Grant was writing, um, was writing, um, a Dick Grayson Batman with, with Damien as Robin. I thought that was such a fun dynamic and it showed a real progression um, for the characters, you know, and I could have kept going with that as long as we wanted to, but ultimately we always got to get Bruce back in the role. We got to get him back in the count. You know, certainly he's got to be back there, but that was a really fun period of time and we had new villains and we had new things. The, there was a great energy around the Batman books at that time that I thought was, was so refreshing, you know? Yeah, Grant Morrison is just, it's one of the geniuses. Yeah. I mean, it, Grant Morrison is amazing, you know. Oh, he, yeah, he's, he, you know, I mean, I've known Grant for a long time. And uh, I tell you, you haven't lived until you sit in a pitch meeting with, with, <laughs> with Grant Morrison. Because <laughs> yeah. he goes on and you're, you're in and you're 100% in. You're like, this is brilliant. I love it. <laughs> then he leaves and you try to explain it to somebody else. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm going, I don't know. It sounded, it made so much sense when he said it. I can't repeat it. And that's that's his that's his strength. He has his ability to tell a story with such confidence in a way that is coming at it from ways you never saw possible. Yet is but is extremely traditional in what you expect a comic book to be. You know, it's just it's just it's just you know it's it's he's you know he's he's, he's a rare breed, and that's what's that's what that's the I mean that's what the that's the real fun of comics is finding people with those types of voices that are so unique. And we can go back to what you said before. So when you have these characters that don't age and don't change, then the reality is you got to rely on the talent to really bring a different voice, a different point of view, a different sensibility to keep them feeling fresh. You mentioned earlier, uh, now that we're talking about like uh, writers that are, or artists that uh, like you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, Keith Giffen. And yeah. I remember one of the first uh, comic books that I started buying was, uh, was this, Thing that got, it got canceled real quick. It was for Image Comics. It was called The Trencher. Trencher. I knew you were going to say Trencher. <laughs> oh, I love that comic. I was a little kid, but I know that wasn't for me. I I, I don't know how they let me buy that, but <laughs> that was <laughs> that was great. But it got he canceled did, real fast. <laughs> Trencher. He did Lunatic, and I think there's one other one. I think it was all the same book. It just kept getting canceled, and he just changed it. <laughs> yeah, because Trencher was more or less. His Lobo, anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's Lobo, it's Lunatic, it's French. <laughs> there was one more in there. I want to think, I forgot who it was, but yeah. <laughs> We talk about that stuff all the time. I mean, that guy, he is, the, he's another one of those rare talents that was just a, just an idea machine, just a machine, you know? And he would, he would, you'd sit in a room and he'd just rapid fire five, six ideas, not married to any of them. You go on one, you throw away every, you could throw away, he could come at you with 20 ideas, you could throw all 20 out, and he come back you with 20 more, and you love them all. And that's the type of, that was what's great about working with Keith. And I, you know, I did, I did a lot, I got a chance to, to write with him and, and co create a couple of stuff with him. So I had a lot of fun working with Keith. And he, It's, it's a trip, man. <laughs> <laughs> it shows in his, in his books. It shows. It's, it's, it's a trip. It's a trip. My, my first time I met Keith Giffen, he was, a, he was actually the first uh, talent that I met when I started working at DC. I, I had my new office. I had my new office. He walked past my office, stuck his head in the door. He goes, run, run as fast as you can. Get out of here. <laughs> Never come back. You're going to kill you. Get out. And he left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what was that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why, but having read Trencher and some of his Lobo work, that sounds, yeah, that sounds like the guy who wrote those books. Yeah, just like Ambush Bug. Yeah, you know, I, I've, I've had my run-ins with him over Ambush Bug, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how about, uh, you know, in this digital age we are right now and more with the whole pandemic thing that's going on, that we have to stay home and how do you see comic books in the digital age like physical media versus digital media like I, yeah. I've, uh -huh. go ahead, go ahead, no because I've, i've been having this discussion with friend for like for like the last uh 10 years i don't know, <laughs> I don't know yeah like I, I'm, i'm always advocating for go digital and leave the, the physical media for collectors and more because it's gonna happen anyway it happened to music 
So basically comic books can become vinyls. What vinyls have, have become for music, it's, it's for collectors and real like uh, people who really want to get that, that real feel, that old school feel. But in terms of how to get your product to the masses, you got to go digital. There's no, there's no. Do I get a count? Do I get a counterpoint from Francesco? Do you Francisco. got a, Francisco. Francisco, do you have a, you have a, do you have a counterpoint? <laughs> no, I, I agree with Carlos hundred percent. I mean, it's just way more accessible to get them digital. I mean, uh, right now where we live, there's no comic sh shops at all. So there's no other way for us to get our comics if it's not digital. So it's a, it, it is a shame for, for the comic book shops and, and, and all those businesses. But uh, I think digital is, is the way things are moving. Okay. Or, or maybe the, the sales say something different. Maybe we're completely wrong and, and physical media is, is going to stay for a while. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's hard to say. Um, I, have, I have a lot of opinions on this. It's all over the place. But um, my, my problem with digital is it's... It, it, we talk about the music business. Uh, music business has collapsed because of uh, the digital, you know, digital sales, pirating, Spotify, you know, you know, Apple Music, anything like that. I mean, it forces them to do certain things a certain way. Um, I don't know if music was as collectible as comics were. I was always a collector kid. I was just, I was just talking to, I was talking to my wife about this, um, and uh, you know, it's. It, any little thing I would collect, you know, like, cause that's just is, you know, I'd like to get full sets. I just, I have that mentality. So it just, it sort of gravitated to this comics and the storytelling and that and moved along. But the problem for us right now is the primary purchases of comics are just collectors. You're selling variant covers. Uh, they're, you're buying speculators, buying books, the, the anticipation that something might be worth more money, like walking dead number one, because of something else happening. Um, you know, TV series, something like that. So it's hard to say. Um, here's my problem. Um, and this is, again, we are comic collectors. We read comics. So it's very natural for us to say this. Um, but reading comics is an acquired taste. That's what I'm going to say. Okay? Um, not everybody gravitates simply to the graphic novel formula of words and pictures. Not everybody reads in that fashion. You have more people reading prose, but to go and read a book with pictures and words, you'd be surprised how many more common casual fans have difficulty reading comics. What panel do we read first? How do I read the balloons? They're not familiar with the rhythm of the comics, and it is something that is um, a segment of a reading population. It's a reading population, but a segment of it. Um, and so therefore, there's something acquired about it. Um, you know, you can track back the origin of comics back to newspaper strips and things like that, and the, the frequency of those. And I think that's what built the, the taste and the appetite for comic book storytelling was all that types of material. But to, to service the size of an audience we have right now, to drive enough money, I don't believe the digital sales would be able to support the size of the industry we have at this moment in time. Um, and therefore the question becomes, uh, who takes on the financial burden of creating material that might not be able to be sellable, um, if people are trying to make a living out of this, you know, so that's where it gets weird. And I think there's a cap on how many people actually want to read comics. And I think that's just a real number. And I don't think just because you make it out there and accessible to everybody that you're going to get so many more people buying it. Not sure. You might have to change the type of material, but the type of books we create today is certainly not created for a mass market. It's not, it's not created for something for a casual reader or somebody to just read on a simple, easy basis on a digital screen. So yeah, you're going to have to change your formula. If you're going to do that, if you're going to change your format, you're going to change your formula. Um, and the question is, everybody just thinks you could take what you do here in print and lift it and shift it and drop it right over digital and everything will be fine. Furthest thing from the truth. You have to rethink your product, your audience, the storytelling, the type of storytelling, the, the way you tell stories. And then once you figure out what people are most comfortable with, then you can create in that fashion. And then maybe you have, might have a chance for success in digital. That, but, that what, what you mentioned about if it's, if it would be, if digital would be sustainable in terms of, uh, to make, to sustain uh, economically the, the, the industry, that's something that we've talked about also. And, and, uh, and it's, 
kind of right now in this COVID pandemic era, it's similar to I think movies are on the, on the danger of, of that with the with the scene, with the theaters closed down and and may, many uh, studios moving to uh, and creators moving to streaming services and if I don't know right now they they announced uh, very very uh, recently a lot of big movies that w were uh, postponed for 2021 including Black Widow. Uh, the Eternals, a whole bunch of movies where we just postponed all the blockbusters basically were postponed for 2021. And the question is, can the movie theaters survive six months more without any new releases? And if they can't, what would be like, we were talking about earlier, like what would be, what would happen then if, if everything move, moves to streaming we possibly lose the blockbusters with the, uh, it, it won't make any sense to produce a movie, a $200 million movie, because you're not going to be able to get that money back through a streaming service. Oh, I, I, you know, I agree with that. That I agree with a hundred percent. I think, I don't think the movie theaters are in danger. I think the $200 million blockbusters are in danger. Mm -hmm. I think that's the real danger. I think you'll always have cinemas. I think people, once they're able to go out, we'll go back out again. You'll be surprised how much, the muscles are going to start going back to when you want to get, then you see that sense of urgency to, to get back to some level of normality right now. And I think there's way for things to go back in and then people will be hesitant, but those people will be very comfortable with it, but you won't get the, the same big numbers, you know, billion dollar movies that are, that, that, uh, that seems to everybody seems to be expecting these days, yes. uh, whatever, whatever they put out. So the reality is, I think what you'll do is you might get things that are smaller, are more affordable, you know what I mean? Less expensive movies, but uh, it'll be interesting to watch how that evolves. I think every, usually what happens, you know, you always see a contraction in an industry when threatened and then ultimately that gradual expansion when you see the, the ability to expand out again. I think you'll see that moment where you can expand again. Um, I think I, I, my hope is that, you know, in, in a year's time or so, when things start to get back into a sense of normal, because I don't think the world is built to work, live out of the house 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. you know? And um, I think, you know, I think people enjoy the, the interaction and the communication and the different things to do in their lives. And I'm hoping that things start to work again. Interestingly enough though, because of the lack of theaters and other things going on in entertainment, the comic stores are actually, some of the stores are actually experiencing a surge in sales. Um, not in new material, but in back issues and in toys. And I've spoke to a couple of stores that actually um, card sales were back up again. They were <laughs> cards and things like the, the guy said to me, he said, you know, my card business has been dead since 1993. And all of a sudden everything I had was off the shelves. It's all gone. <laughs> and it's, you know what? It's for us crazy collectors. We're taking this moment in time to, to, to complete our collections, find all those missing things and pieces to fill in those books. Um, cause that's what you do. <laughs> and also we're forgetting the one thing where was drawing a lot of attention and a lot of money and a lot of interest is conventions. That's also mm -hmm. shut down. I think that's also helped the comic stores. Comic store now becomes back, becomes the community spot again, not the convention, but the store itself. So this is a moment where we can regain and hopefully rebuild um, our sense of community with our fans and grow our fan base again. And again, this is, goes back to your casual fans or people who don't traditionally read comics that if they are looking to go something or try to get something, we had a lot of people walking through conventions that were there just for the experience, not there because they were comic collectors or anything. They just wanted the experience. They've heard about it. So if we could find a way to chance for that experience back to the store, we could bring those people in, expose them to our material and hopefully be a final way to, to, to grow the grow the audience again and grow the grow grow interest in, in the business, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that, those are very good points. I guess it is. I did I did like when there used to be a comic book store here. I did like go, going in and, and talking to the people and, and uh, what are you reading and uh, yeah. I'm reading this and. Yeah, when you go to digital, that you you lose that sense of community. So that's that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you listen. The digital. I have. First of all, if you look at the digital, what are the two things that people are looking for? Digital, cheap or free? Nah. Um, you know, that's usually the first two things you're looking for. 
Um, and there's a lot of sites that provide material for free that are not exactly legal. Um, you know, and that's, that's disappointing because ultimately that impacts the creators. People don't think that when they're downloading something for free, that it's actually taking a negative impact on somebody whose livelihood is based on that sale. It's not about the big companies. A lot of these comics now are about the, about the individuals, you know? Um, so that's an interesting thing. But I mean, the reality is digital is a good supplement, but not a replacement. How about that? You know? Yeah, that's what's happening right now anyway. It's, it's been with Comixology and Marvel Unlimited and now DC, uh, what's it going to be called? Uh, they changed the DC... Ex In Infinite or something, yeah. DC Infinite. Yeah, it's kind of similar to Marvel Unlimited, DC Infinite. It's Unlimited, Infinite, it's kind of the same. Oh, makes sense, yeah. They're always like that. Both companies are always... <laughs> I always used to say Infinite was a DC word. Secret was a Marvel word, Unlimited was an Infinite was a DC word. <laughs> Price is a DC word. War is a Marvel word. It's a way to put it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we're seeing that with, with, those, with those apps plus comic book are still being published and printed uh, in, a, in a physical in a, in a physical way. So we're we're actually seeing that, like what you said, uh, supplement, uh, a complement one to another. Yeah. Just to, to, yeah, that's basically it's a place to catch up on older your your back issues. Uh, let's read some story arc from no, the seventies or no, something. You know, no, not only that, but it's a way to capture all the audience, like. It, Yeah. Whoever wants the physical media, it is available. Whoever wants the digital media, it is available. Like, however, you you have to. I get it. What they do anyway in this uh, in this um, um, in this apps like uh, Unlimited or Infinite, like they don't give you uh, the the new issues. Like the the the, the right. just the the new releases are not right there at the same time. And, and I get it. You have to uh, um, you have to. Uh, Ah, promovel. Eh, eh. Oh, yeah, you have to give the chance to the, 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 the yeah. to be sold. Encourage, you know? encourage. You have to encourage people. You have to encourage people to buy the physical media because it's the one that makes the more money, and it's the one that takes more money to to produce. I, I think I think the, the I think what digital is a great tool for is uh, to help you promote graphic novel sales. We haven't gotten into graphic novels. We talk about periodicals. The real business is graphic novels. That's on a shelf, but there's so much product over there right now. They're crowding themselves off. Um, so only again, there's a, there's a, uh, there, there's a, a very much of a, um, a of a, um, a selection taking place in the stores about which graphic novels they put out. They don't put everything out. They just put the ones they think sell best. So not everything gets exposed, but the good part about digital is that digital could create a level of interest in certain books that then could drive people for a collection to help help build uh, interest in something. And, and collections are the best way for people to catch up and get a real true sense of who these characters are because uh, you get a much more um, uh, value-oriented purchase. You know, the omnibuses or some of these, these, you get a complete story, which is even more important in cases, you know? I, I think that's, that's valuable too, you know? Yeah. So, I think this, uh, so what's next for you, Dan? What, what, what are you, are you looking forward to going back to TV? Are you going to stay in comic book? What do you want to do? What do you want to do now? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Well, the good part is I was getting ready to figure something out and then the whole world decided to stop. <laughs> <laughs> no? so thank you, everybody. Uh, no, <laughs> I mean, what, what happened was, you know, I was, I, you know, naturally I, I like to keep busy and everything like that, but I think one of the things the, the pandemic did in a positive way for me, it allowed me to slow down uh, and actually take some time down and, 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 and recharge, recharge the batteries a little bit. And uh, I've got, I've got some, I've got some fun little projects and things that I've been working on. And actually one of the things uh, I'm going to be starting in the next couple of weeks is I've, I'm going to be teaching a class at the Kubert school. Um, I'm, I've always been a, a friend and a fan of the school. I'm working on their advisory board right now. Um, so I agreed to give a class or two, which is kind of fun. Um, because I, just like these talks that we're having here, I forget how much I enjoy speaking and talking about comics. Um, and one of the things I feel that's very important is in all these classes and things that I hear, I hear people discussing 
you know, how to draw something or how to work a line of dialogue or just how to lay out a story. And I'm more interested in helping people prepare for the business of comics because it is a business and it's, it's how you sell yourself and how you work, how you work for people. But also if you're creating your own properties, how you represent your own property properly and what you should be looking for in, in trying to get it placed or produced and what you should be trying to control and where you have to give up control in order to make sure your project gets sold and made. <laughs> so these, these are things that I think that are important skills, uh, especially for more people trying to get in, because I think it's essential, essential that of uh, comic creators, we get a younger base in here with a younger voice and younger sensibility. If you think about those great Marvel stories of the 70s, you've talked about guys like Jerry Conway or Len Wein or Mark Wolfman. These guys are in their 20s. Jerry Conway, I believe, and I, I probably got the year wrong, but he's somewhere between 22 and 26 years old when he's editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics. Think about it. You know, most of us are just, you know, figuring out, not even figuring out what we're doing. And this guy is running the entire Marvel line. But but there's a youthfulness and a voice and an energy and, you know, and just a, rec a fearlessness that made these comics better at that period of time. And we need young and more fearless voices to really help broaden out what the energy is. But it has to be tempered with craft. It can't be just people just putting stuff on a table. You have to be able to help focus them so that you'll be able to tell your story properly in a way that becomes accessible to people. And that's sort of the stuff that we're going to be working on together with, with, the, with these classes. So it's a lot of fun, you know, and, uh, you know, because he, this, you have to you have to find a way to balance your creative and your business. They're, they're two sides, mm -hmm. two sides of the same coin, unfortunately, these days. And the more awareness comics have, the more you realize you're in the business of comics, just not in the hobby of comics, you know, and we have to start exercising the hobby aspect out of the industry. So it is more about business and then let the people who, who, who are buying it, let it be their hobby. That mm -hmm. you, can make. you know what I mean? So a little bit of that going on. Do you, do you get in the time you were with the, in the industry, do you get a lot of that uh, in the new, like in new, when, when new talent got in, Like, were they still seeing it as a hobby? Was it difficult to get people to stop seeing it as a hobby and start seeing it as a, as a business, as a, as a, as a, as a job? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. Um, because if you go back, if you, if you go back in the way back machine, okay, way back machine in comics, um, you get people who break into comics writers and you had a very strong editorial pool directing them and teaching them how to write. And in those days, some of the best talent were actually the editors. Why? Because the editors were paid better than the talent. So these guys, if they wanted a better paycheck, they didn't write more comics. They, they went into a, a managerial position and a teaching position in editing or something like that in those days. And then as time progressed, the, the, the com and more books would be created and more people would need to be writing, the writers were pay being paid better than the editors. So then all the good talent was actually writing and then the editors started to be more about administrative and talent management and all those things. And because their workloads were so big, they had less time to really work with these people and improve the craft. Um, so that started to change. And then ultimately on the other side, The younger talent, when it became big and hot, they'd start in Marvel and DC, they get big and hot in Marvel and DC, then they go off and do their own projects here. Um, now what you have is either you have new talent come in, they get big and hot in Marvel and DC, and they stay around. They stick around because their names help sell books. And then they, the priorities start to change for them because they're moving at a different pace. They have other interests. So it becomes less about the cohesiveness of the universe and more about the individual voices. And it starts to fragment things a little bit more. So it, it's, it's, it's a hard balance because you need that name recognition and the strength of the talent, but you also need the cooperativeness and the, and the collaboration that becomes in into building a shared universe. And finding that balance again is going to be an interesting thing for the people who are managing these lines right now because people have so many things pulling at them and any one writer Not only does he have comic books writing, but he might be in writing. He used to be just writing in prose. Now we might have a movie development over here. Might have a TV script over here. He has three creator-owned books over there. And it's not just about working for the company or one company. It's about managing their brand more so than working to build the line of somebody else's. So it's, does, he, does that make any sense or uh, did I just ramble too much? I was, I, was trying to be, I was trying to be very vague at the same time. I realized I, I went down a rabbit hole, so I apologize. <laughs> bottom, bottom, bottom line is 
it, they're at a point right now where it's time to start teaching craft again about the strength of what comics and storytelling is. Go back to the core sensibilities of what makes comics great and see if we can start to build out the industry again, ground up. That's what I'm really saying. Young voices, young talent, new ideas, but with built with a sense of craft that we know is what makes comics great. Yeah, that was simpler. <laughs> great set up the stuff. Go right to the- <laughs> I'm not editing anything. I'm not editing yeah. it. Stays and, that's all, and that's only one beer, guys. It's only one beer. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we always like I mentioned uh, in the email I sent you in the notes I sent like we always talk about beers and, and we talk about movies so there's always this uh, this thing we do we like to play around and, and ask what was the last movie you watched I don't know what, what was, was the last movie he watched he doesn't know what was the last movie I watched I don't know our guest what and maybe we can talk about in, that in, in, wait, wait, in, in the theater or no, no, in no, the, no 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 just the last movie you watched from beginning, yeah from yeah. beginning to end it doesn't matter if, if you liked it or not it's just the last movie you watched doesn't matter do you remember yeah but this morning I watched this morning I watched <laughs> I watched Murders in the Rue Morgue with Jason Robots from 1971 from American International Pictures. I love crappy horror movies. I've never heard of that movie. There you go. I, I love sat, my Saturday morning and my Sunday morning is watching bad monster movies. So I, <laughs> I, so I get one off a one off cable on, uh, on Saturday morning and then on Sunday morning I tape. Uh, there's a show called Sven Gulli. Which is a um, horror host show that runs on Saturday night on one of the cable channels. I tape it every Saturday night and watch it every Sunday morning. That is my pride and joy of my weekend. And this is what happens when you get old. That's all I got to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if it's, if, it, if it's what happens when, when you get old. Because I think it calls back to your love for Gorgila. Yeah, oh, well, I can, I can, I can literally watch this all day long. <laughs> that goes without saying. That's an easy one. I, you know, I, I, I actually love, we love watching, we love watching monster movies. What was it? No, watch the movie. You know what we saw yesterday? We saw uh, Gemini Man with Will Smith. I haven't seen it yet. Is it good? Oh, yeah, yeah. Save yourself some trouble, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's nothing like nothing better than a than a sniper assassin with a heart of gold. <laughs> you should go meet the prostitute with the heart of gold. This is what I say. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. Will Smith is doing a sniper assassin with the heart of gold again? Did it, didn't yeah. he do that? In, did, didn't he do that in Suicide Squad? He sure did, man. Yeah. They, 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 <laughs> Not only does he the Gemini Man, but he, he plays himself in his clone, so he does it twice in the same movie. Crazy. Wait, so, oh, so it's the, wow, again. <laughs> it's that, that shot again. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, that's too bad. The trailers look good. That's, that's a disappointment. Oh well. Yeah, it was. It's, it was a disappointment. It's, it's directed by Ang Lee, who I actually really like. Yeah, his really good director. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, it's but then the, if you go back and you read about the movie, it's one of those movies that was in development for like 20, 30 years or something. It's like one of these scripts. It's, the script originally started with Clint Eastwood. Let's put it that way, and it worked its way over 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 to Will Smith over 20, 30 years time with with, with Jerry Bruckheimer. So it's like I sometimes you just gotta let things go. I, I did that in comics. I used to hold on to ideas and try to make it work, and then when we did it, it didn't work and you're like oh, I should have let it go when I when I had a chance you know <laughs> so Will Smith was originally going to play the younger the younger version and then they were going to CGI the older one but <laughs> yeah, no, by the time they made it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah Francis, right. Francisco what's the, what was the last movie you watched Uh, the last movie I watched was uh, Enola Holmes uh, on Netflix. Uh, it's, it's about that uh, the younger sister of Sherlock Holmes. It's uh, not, I'm not the demographic for that movie. I think it's more for like 15 or 16 year old girls maybe. But it was actually pretty fun. It was a, it was a good movie. I, I, I liked uh, Millie Bobby Brown uh, doing a different character that's not uh, Eleven from Stranger Things. I liked Henry Cavill as Sherlock Holmes. It was it was a pretty good movie. It was a fun time. Oh, that's good. Okay, we we have that on our list. Yeah, we have it on the oh. list. Yeah, and uh, Helena Bonham Carter uh, the, uh, plays the the mother. Uh, she's, she's always great. Yeah. yeah, she's always great. Wait, but it's not a Tim Burton movie. 
Is it? No. So strange, right? <laughs> Helena, <laughs> Helena Bonham Carter in a movie that's not from Tim Burton. What? Yeah. <laughs> that happens? <laughs> so what about you, Carlos? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, last, last, mo oh. <laughs> last movie I watched was a 1985 cult classic, sci-fi cult classic that I hadn't watched since I was a kid and I decided to watch it, revisit it. Enemy Mine. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow, deep cut, deep cut. <laughs> yeah. And I, I didn't remember much about the movie uh, from when I was a kid, but uh, rewatching it now, like, you know what? The first two acts of that movie are great. It's awesome sci-fi drama with a beautiful message. Yeah. The third act, it becomes a, an action set piece that really doesn't work out and feels really, oh, really rushed. I haven't, seen, I haven't seen that one in a long time. Yeah. Yeah, the, the third act becomes like an action set piece that feels kind of rushed. Uh, but the thing I took away from the movie is like, why haven't they, this is a perfect example of a, a great concept that could work even better today if it got remade. Yeah. If, if, do the, if they do a remake of that movie and fix that third act, I think it could be awesome. I was going to say, give them time. They remade everything. They're running out of movies for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the actress that played the, 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 that played the, the main character? Lugosi? No, no, no uh, the, the actors were uh, the, the human, the human was a... Uh, Dennis Quaid. Dennis Quaid, right? Dennis Quaid, Dennis Quaid. and, and Lugosi Lugosi. Jr. was the, the alien, who did a, a, a great, I mean, that was real, like, it was great acting. I mean, he was playing yeah. an alien, he was playing a male and a female at the same time, because it was, uh, the, the, that alien species was, was kind of androgynous and had yeah. both, like, and so it was really interesting to, to see him with all that costume and the makeup, still see, yeah. like, he, him trying to convey all, all the, the mannerisms, Uh, of everything that was going on, like everything that, even when he got pregnant, I'm spoiling yeah, a movie for, that's from like 15, oh, uh, like 20. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, it's a, more than 20 years ago, like it's a, more than 30 years ago. I mean, but yeah, I, I think they should remake that movie. It would be awesome, like with today's technology and if they fix that third act, it just would be great. There you go. Um, What else do we got? Dan, do you want to talk about something else? Anything you have in mind? No, not at all. I'm here to just drink beer and talk about comics, I guess. <laughs> all right. There were, there were a couple of things that from the beginning of the show that Frank, Francisco and I were... I call him Frank. When I say Frank or Frank, it's, I'm referring to Francisco. So it's okay, I figured there's only three boxes. I had to figure that this <laughs> I, I, I thought he was your sidekick for a little while there. I hate to say <laughs> That's funny. So, from the beginning of the show, uh, there were two things that we haven't talked about that happened in the last couple of weeks. And do you guys see the One Division trailer? Ah, that was really good. What's that? I, yeah, I did. One Division. One Division. One Division. Yeah. 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 I'm, uh, yeah. Okay. I like. I, I, it's interesting. I mean, I, I have no concept of what the show's about or what it's what's going to go on there. But you know, that, it, that's what I liked about the trailer. Like they showed you a lot of confusing <laughs> stuff. If you're if you're following the MCU and you see this, it's like, what the hell is going on? Yeah, yeah. But it looks interesting, and you know, I don't know. It I, it makes me think of House of M, and maybe uh, the there was a uh, I think it was in the '90s that there was a Vision comic that was written that was basically. Uh, as if it was a sitcom, a, 50, a 1950 sitcom. So yeah, I think they're basing their, the, the, their show on that, I think. There was a recent Vision comic. I think Tom King wrote it. It's yeah. uh, similar to that. And, uh, you know, with Scarlet Witch's uh, reality-altering powers, it seems right. like she's in this weird universe she created uh, where Vision's still alive and they're a family. It's, it's interesting. Yep. Only, uh, the only thing I'm expecting from this series is to have them finally call her Scarlet Witch in, in, on screen. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I always like Scarlet Witch. I actually, you know what's funny? Because in the, in the 70s, when I first started reading the Avengers, the relationship with Scarlet Witch and Vision was developing then. So that was one of the things that, you know, you were always rooting for as a kid, you know, looking for these guys to get together. So it's amazing where we are right now when you remember those stories early on. 
you know. <laughs> and who knows, maybe these series and then when they finally do Doctor Strange and the multiverse or whatever it's going to be called, maybe that's just, this is the way that they're going to bring mutants into the MCU now that they own Fox. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, like I said, there's, you know, I mean, one of my personal favorites is Fantastic Four. Uh, that's what I'm probably more excited about that. I, I, I like the X-Men, but I, I love the Fantastic Four. Um, and so I'm always hoping uh, for a, a take that, you know, feels like w for what I remember it to be. You know, it, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what and they come I, up with. And I think Fantastic Four is even easier to bring into the existing MCU right now. Well, yeah. it's not just, for, for that, listen, you know, you look at Fantastic Four, just the, the I, I think Fantastic Four is a comic. Um, mid 30 in mid, around the early 30 issues in the thir early 30s all the way through mid 50s on that is probably the, the single greatest run of comics ever told uh for creativity and storytelling and ideas and excitement um just it's just the the level of um the, that's you know stanley jack Kirby working together man just the level of creativity and energy is 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 something just to behold it's You know, every every book was just exploding with new things and some of the stuff I, I just love the most. And, uh, and uh, you know, for somebody to hopefully get to a spot where they can be able to capture that, and you know the technology is there to do it now, um, you know, you're always hoping that somebody's able to pull that one off. But I actually, love those. Yeah, and, and actually I think Fantastic Four is a good property that could work in as a Disney Plus series, uh, like some like a Twilight Zone kind of like a, a, a series, like every episode is a different, like they're – Uh, a different uh, story, a different universe, a different place they visit, or something. There were like I think Fantastic Four could lend itself to something like that. that that's that's a, that's how the early comic used to read. They used to yeah. see worlds, microverses, and different planets, and aliens are coming in, and all stuff going on. It, it, it was a, it was just it's just a lot of fun, just a lot of fun. I mean, uh, who knows? We'll see. You know, whatever they come up with. I mean, it's it's interesting to see as this stuff develops. Um, you know, and. Uh, You know, for me now, it's a lot easier to watch this stuff now that I'm not working and feeling that everything's in competition. Because <laughs> when, when I was working in publishing, um, I saw the movies and the TV shows to be competition with us. So if they did something better than us, then that was less reason to buy a comic book. So that always put that challenge in front of us to make sure that we had to do something uh, to compete, you know, on some level. But it's, you know, it's, it's interesting to watch for sure. You Are know? there any like comic book related shows uh, you're actually watching or uh, uh, maybe you saw uh, Watchmen or, or, or the I saw Watchmen. Or... I, I, we, I got into Watchmen late and then I went back and watched the whole thing and I thought it was brilliant. Um, and you know what? I, I, I watch very little superhero television because it, it, it's, you know, it, You know, it's, it's like, uh, it's, I always put it in the analogy and it's like sports, sports players going home and then watching other people playing the game. It's like, I, you spent the whole day with it. I don't need to watch anymore, you know? Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I watch a little bit here and there. Um, I'm more interested. I'm always watching to see what's trending. I'm more interested in what's trending. I'm intrigued by what's, what's in the zeitgeist. That's another thing that I feel got lost a little in comics because intriguingly, if you look back again in comics, Uh, when Westerns were big, they had Western comics. When horror was big, there was horror comics. You know, when you see the Kung Fu craze or uh, the black exploitation films and creating characters and stories, comics sort of rode the waves of these things. Now the interesting thing is that the, the, the wave, of crazy, the wave the, that's in there right now is comics, is superheroes. So what do superheroes do if they're actually the zeitgeist right now? How do you, how do you tap into it? You know what I mean? It's like, wait a minute, that's us, you know? Um, if, if you look at the two things that are hottest right now are superheroes and nostalgia. And geez, that is comic books. That, that's all comic talk. So in theory, they should be hotter than anything, and yet they're not. And that's a problem. You know, that, that means something's not connecting somewhere. And that's, just, that's the stuff that got to be figured out, you know? All right, so the last thing I got here that we were going to talk about is uh, that we were going to mention is that... HBO Max is going crazy ordering series based on movies that Warner Brothers hasn't uh, finished yet. Because <laughs> now they want, they already announced they wanted a series based on the Batman that Matt Reeves is shooting right now. Yeah. And, and now they announced that they want a, a mini series uh, 
based on Peacemaker, the character that John Cena plays in the Suicide Squad from James Gunn that it has not released, that has not finished production yet. But yeah, HBO Max wants everything. Uh, yeah, they want everything. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I don't know. I think I don't think John Cena is that great an actor. I mean, but, <laughs> I mean, but I don't know if. If James Gunn's going to be involved in the series somehow, maybe it could work. Because James mm -hmm. Gunn tends to bring good stuff out of people that do not act like Batista in the Guardians. And look, if James Gunn was able to pull off Guardians of the Galaxy, you got to yeah. give him the without man. That is, you know what? I mean, that was the most interesting bet I've ever seen in my life. Because um, Guardians of the Galaxy is just peripherally interesting at best uh, as a comic book. And, you know, and not only that, he took the a new interpretation of it, not the original interpretation. Uh -huh. um, and he found a way to make that thing work in ways that, for me, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the superhero movies, but I, I really enjoyed the first Guardians movie and the second Guardians movie. Thought they were smart and fun and, and had a lot of heart and, and super violent at the same time. I mean, Jesus. How many, how many Novas did they kill? Anyway, um, <laughs> but but I think I think that's going to be interesting to see. Um, like I said, superheroes in the zeitgeist. You know, superhero storytelling is the new morality tale. It is the new Western. You know, think about if you look, go back to the 50s and 60s and all that, how the Westerns, every channel had Westerns on the air. And then you go to police and detective dramas. And that's been replaced by superheroes. They're doing the same story, just with superheroes and guys in kites. Except we're already getting into the parody of them with things like the boys and other things. I love the boys. Means, usually <laughs> right. when you get to the parody, that usually means you're coming to the end of a trend. But um, this seems to feel like there's still a lot of uh, energy in there. I think that's why WandaVision, why you're reacting well, because it plays against the archetype of a superhero show. So therefore, they're taking the superhero thing, but moving it in an interesting way um, that makes sense. And I think what's also interesting about WandaVision, most of the, the comic book properties that move different than superhero ones, you don't even know they're comic book properties for the most part. A lot of people don't know that. Um, a lot of people didn't know that Red was a comic book movie, you know, because of, it was, you know what I mean? There's things like that. But because Wanda and Vision are tied so much to the Avengers story and, and all that, all, everything that goes on with the Marvel Universe, this is something that's playing against the expectation of the Marvel Universe. So that's an interesting risk to take. Um, and I think it's a, the, it, they're taking it at the right time, you know? So that's why it's, hopefully it works, you know, it'd be good, you know? Uh, you but mentioned, it's, a good bet. it's a good bet for them to make, that's for sure, you know? You mentioned that when you start to get into the parodies, that means that that's when it's uh, going down the, the, the yeah. peak. Like it's, going, it's coming back down from the peak. But, yeah. uh, and I don't know. I mean, who would have thought HBO would ask for <laughs> talking about coming down from the peak, like a series about Peacemaker? <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to think. I, I'm gonna. If I have to say anything, I have to feel that it's gonna play against the superhero genre rather than embrace it. <laughs> I think so. Of course. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I so. somebody should tell the peacemaker and comedian the same guy. That's the thing that's really interesting. <laughs> the, the, the character, the peacemaker, is is more or less a uh, parody anyway. So. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What was the what was his tagline for a while? Um, Willing, uh, willing to keep the peace so much, willing to, to kill people to keep the peace or something, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Got it. Uh, peace uh, at all costs or something. Yeah, no yeah. peace. Peace, no matter how many you have, how many people you have to kill or something like that. Something like that. It's like, <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> it's almost an election slogan. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, what else? I think we're done. we've done with everything. We're done with everything we had for the show today. Dan, well, hopefully, hopefully, I answered all your questions in the most meandering way possible. <laughs> <laughs> it was great, Dan. Yeah, it was great. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Uh, take Thank care. Um, I don't know what else to say. Like it was, it was, yeah, it my, was awesome. my only I, my only disappointment was we didn't have more beer. I, would, I, I somebody sold me on the, on the somebody sold me on the beer pot, and I only had one, one bottle. So I'm gonna have to make up. You have to make up for lost time. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, I'm so I, I, I'm sorry. We we started before you. We started half an hour before you, and we. Oh, uh, that's a, that's a, now you tell me. Now you yeah, tell me. Yeah, like. A, 
All the glasses are empty now. Though. There you go. Okay, I got my second. Now I'm good. I will drink. This, I will drink a half hour after you. Then okay. <laughs> Well, we always, uh, we always, uh, the way we say goodbye in the show, it's not, a, it's kind of a mean thing to say in Spanish, but we say it anyway. Okay, do it. Okay, I got a translator here, so that's good. And I'm empty right now, so it won't make much sense, but we say salud cabrones. Salud. <laughs> Okay. You don't have to say it. You don't have to say it. You don't have to say it. I can do it in English. I know that one too. So. Well, so much just the same, gentlemen. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Ya llegó. Ya llegó. El coño show. El coño show. El coño show. Whoa!